Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 48 of the Ask Historians podcast. So today we have a very special guest. We have Dr. Alex Wellerstein. Uh, he hangs out on uh, Ask Historians as restricted data, but he is probably much better well known out in the, the real world as, well, Dr. Alex Wellerstein, a, a assistant professor of uh, science technology studies at the College of Arts and Letters at the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, he specializes in the, the history of nuclear weapons and nuclear secrecy and runs a fairly well-known and, and excellently well-regarded blog, uh, which you can find at Nuclear Secrecy, no spaces, so just nuclearsecrecy.com. And uh, and on that, you can also find the, the nuke map that we'll talk about as well, where you can kind of drop simulated uh, nuclear weapons on things. Uh, it's a great deal of fun. Uh, but today we're talking to uh, Dr. Wallstein about, uh, well, uh, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, which just uh, in the past week celebrated, well, past week plus, celebrated uh, 71 years of an anniversary. Uh, kind of, you know, one of those more bittersweet uh, anniversaries, of course, as sometimes history sometimes gives us. Uh, but what we're going to be talking about is well, in part, we're going to be talking about how it is a very well-covered subject. But before we get into that, we're really going to spend some time talking about the the behind-the-scenes conversation that was going on really amongst you know, documents and conversations that were you know, top secret and highly, highly, highly classified. Uh, and so we'll talk about the conversations that were going on behind the scenes and out, out of the view of the public or people who didn't have top secret clearance about you know how to use these weapons uh you know why to use these weapons what's the proper you know means of deployment what is the kind of the obligation of the the state deploying these weapons uh and it's a fascinating conversation particularly when it comes down to kind of uh, i think there are tangent aside into you know what did president truman know uh, or really not so much what he knew but what he understood is is kind of a fascinating question in and of itself We'll segue from there to talk about uh, kind of the, the difficulty of doing historical research on topics that, you know, at some point are top secret uh, and therefore are a little hard to get your hands on, uh, you know, these primary documents. Uh, and Alex has some amazing things to say about that and some comparisons to kind of the other uh, fields of history and the difficulties faced there. Uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of close up by talking about what it means to be, uh, uh, you know, a popularizer of history of someone who tries to go out you know, outside the ivory tower and and kind of the merits of there being an ivory tower, but also the merits of there being, you know, the people who, who will reach out and engage with the public uh, about matters of, you know, science and technology, but also history and also the history of science and technology, you know, these, these interrelated fields. Uh, so it's a wonderful episode. And I can tell you uh, just from having recording it, uh, that Alex is an absolute, uh, he's an absolute charmer, and I hope you'll enjoy the episode. But I know what you're all really here for. It is the first episode of the month, so we are doing our uh, monthly book giveaway. So as usual, if you are a supporter on our Patreon, uh, which is patreon.com forward slash ask historians, uh, for just a dollar, you can get a ticket into this. Uh, for five dollars, you get two tickets. Uh, and then for ten dollars, you get uh, three tickets, essentially. Uh, and then beyond that, you just you're just kind of I don't know. You're just supporting the show and thanks. Uh, so what we do is every first of every month, we pick out four books uh, as kind of as a selection. And then the winner of the raffle gets to pick one of them. So uh, the first book that we have is Margaret McMillan's The Uses and Abuses of History. The second book is Mark Molesky's This Gulf of Fire, The Destruction of Lisbon or Apocalypse in the Age of Science and Reason. The third book is Grant Jones, The Conquest of the Last Maya Kingdom. And finally, we also have kind of in the vein of what we're going to be talking about today, John W. Dower's Embracing Defeat, Japan in the Wake of World War II. So our lucky winner will get to pick one of those books and I will ship it to their door, hot and fresh, uh, much like a pepperoni pizza, only more educational. So uh, I've done a raffle random number generator of our Patreon subscribers, and so I won't bother with the fake drum roll. The winner is... Elm. So Elm, I'll be sending you a message uh, via, I don't know, there's probably other ways I can get a hold of you, but we'll, we'll send it through the, the, the Patreon email that you have so we can make this official. Uh, and you get to pick one of those and I will ship it to your door. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy the episode. And once again, it's it's a wonderful episode and I had a great deal of fun talking to Alex Wellerstein about um, nuclear bombings. So I hope you enjoy it as well. Welcome to the 
the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians podcast. Today, I'm talking to Alex Wellerstein, uh, who is probably best known as the author of the blog uh, Restricted Data, the Nuclear Secrecy blog. Uh, prior to that, he'd earned a BA in history at UC Berkeley uh, before going on to receive his PhD uh, at Harvard, and then going on from there to have, uh, let's see, a long list of accomplishments here. So uh, he was the Edward Teller Graduate Fellow in Science and uh, Security Studies. And that was with the Office of History and Heritage Resources with the Department of Energy. That's the U.S. Department of Energy, not any of those uh, non-patriotic departments. He was a research fellow at the Atom Project in the International Security Program at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's previously taught at Georgetown and the American Institute of Physics. And he also has positions at, at the American Heritage Foundation and also Alsos Digital Library. And his work has appeared on NPR, uh, The New Yorker, and even Fox and The Daily Show. However, today, uh, right now, he is uh, currently... A, I believe a uh, historian of science, uh, assistant professor at the Science and Technology Studies in the College of Arts and Letters at the Stevens Institute of Technology at Hoboken, New Jersey. So, Alex, welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. And also, uh, perhaps maybe people best know you by uh, a little creation you have called the Nuke Map, which allows people to just, you know, from the comfort of their chairs, drop nuclear, simulated nuclear weapons of various sizes and makes uh, anywhere on the world, uh, depending depending on what Google Maps shows. So, Alex, let me just ask you right now, who would you nuke and with what? <laughs> well, I just want to first say, and maybe this is relevant, it's the Atomic Heritage Foundation, not the American <laughs> Heritage Foundation. Okay, sorry. Uh, and and, and maybe it would be the Heritage Foundation <laughs> yeah. is who I would nuke. No, I don't know. Uh, 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 I, uh, if, if I were going to nuke anything, uh, it would hopefully not be any thing on this planet. I think we've had enough of those All right. uh, for well, our film. That <laughs> includes our, our interview with uh, galactic terrorist Alec Wallerstein. No, <laughs> so <laughs> I think today we're going to be talking about, because it, the anniversary of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, uh, as we're speaking, are just uh, maybe a couple days away here. Um, and so I think we're going to talk a lot about that because it's, I mean, that is, that's the start of our nuclear age. But also, uh, a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, this was a top secret, beyond top secret government project. So, you know, there are some, I guess you could say, difficulties in studying something like that. From from some of the, the, the materials I've read on your blog, it seems like there is kind of a parallel discussion going on. And the fact that there is a discussion behind the scenes p between people who knew what was going on, scientists, the Manhattan Project, the Army, the Air Force... And then there was this whole, uh, I guess, blank space out in the public knowledge. Can you tell us a little about the conversation that was happening behind the scenes? So this is one of the things that makes it both difficult and extremely fun to study. Uh, you, you're always in a sort of detective mode if you don't have a clearance. And I don't have one. I've never had one. Um, and I wouldn't want one because what's the fun in knowing if you don't get to tell anybody about things? Uh, one, one of the things that I found really interesting is, is we tend to imagine this as being there's those who are on the outside, like me, like you, and then there's those on the inside, and, and that the people on the inside know the whole story. And usually, though, um, they don't. They know a version of the inside story because the inside isn't one space, right? The people uh, – the secret world is not one world where you get your – clearance and suddenly you get to know everything it's uh it's it's divided up into lots of subspaces so they the official name for this policy is uh, compartmentalization sometimes called need to know uh, but this has always been the case it, there, there's very few people who actually have a vision of the whole story and so this adds an even uh, additional layer of depth to trying to figure out what was going on if you're looking at uh, any sufficiently complicated historical question like how did the United States develop the hydrogen bomb? That's a nice question. Even how did the United States develop the atomic bomb? Uh, there's very few people who actually see the whole uh, the whole field. You'll get people at one lab who don't even know about the existence of another lab or know where it is. Maybe they only know it exists because of a code name. Um, you get people in different branches of the government who are, you know, behind the secret wall. So the FBI and the Atomic Energy Commission do not always share information totally between each other. And there's reasons for that that are sort of official secrecy reasons, right? Like we don't want the FBI to necessarily know how to make nuclear weapons. They don't need to know how to do that. 
Uh, but there's also sort of bureaucratic reasons, right? So they sometimes play games with each other where the FBI knows that Congress knows something, but the Atomic Energy Commission doesn't know. And they're going to leverage that knowledge in an attempt to sort of gain favor in Washington because uh, knowledge is powerful, not just in the sense that it makes weapons, but it, it allows you to, say, gain curry, uh, curry favor with the uh, the president or with other branches who might have power that might be able to give you things that you want. So there's sort of an endless, I don't want to make it like a spy game because it's not a spy game. Nobody's like chasing me and, you know, with, with gray f- uh, flannel suits and guns or anything. I mean, that's uh, but the, there's a lot of, there's a rabbit hole you can go down and it becomes just endlessly fun. So I don't know things for sure, but there's things that I do know because they've been declassified that say somebody at the time might not have known. So anyway, just to add extra layers of complexity to this. Yeah. And, and some of these things are really just mundane administrative details, it seems sometimes. I mean, admittedly, these mundane, when we're talking about, you know, the, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, these mundane administrative details involve bombing and deaths of tens of thousands of people. But you know, I was kind of amazed to see the the wrangling that was going back and forth over just choosing which city to bomb. Uh, because, you know, we tend to think of like, oh, yeah, it was Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that was probably, you know, those set, those were obvious targets. But when it comes down to it, there, a lot of the behind the scenes work that was going on was kind of saying, well, why would we bomb this place and not this place? What is the best place to do this? And it kind of comes down almost as kind of like a, a, a petty inner office fight sometimes. One of the really interesting things about the atomic bomb that that's getting worked out in the uh, World War II period when it's the bomb itself is getting worked out is this question of who makes decisions about it. Today, we generally take it for granted, and this has come up quite a bit with the recent election uh, uh, news, that the president is the person with whom the buck stops, right? That the that atomic bombs are not military weapons, that they are in some sense uh, political weapons. They're weapons that need to be uh, uh, invested with a responsibility that goes beyond sort of career military people and instead has to be elected. They have to be some sort of representation of uh, the people in a democratic society, right? And that was getting worked out in this period. And that's something that I find is a nice historian point to make, that these things that we sort of see as being so obvious and so necessary – uh, they were not obvious at the time. So we tend to imbue Truman sort of as the president with a lot of this responsibility when a lot of this was being worked out by other people below him. And this question on which target and what targets, who makes that decision? Is it is it the army who is usually in charge of determining, you know, tactical operations, right? They're, they're not consulting with Washington before they go bomb a city. That's being uh, a decision that's being made out in the field, depending on what they see as, you know, the conditions. Uh, is it the Secretary of War, which would now be the Secretary of Defense, which is to say an unelected civilian appointee who is ostensibly in charge of war policy? Is it the president? Is it the, the scientist who made the weapon or is it the, the, the captain of the specific bomber squadron that has been training with how to drop the weapon? And this is uh, very much up in flux at the time. Uh, the, the, the head of the Manhattan Project uh, was a military guy, General Groves, and he uh, hoarded a lot of power. He, he, he did this for a bunch of reasons, but secrecy was one of them. But he generally didn't consult with a lot of people above him. Basically, officially, only the president was sort of above him on these matters. And that led him to favor certain targets, uh, specifically the target of Kyoto as one of the, the major uh, uh, early ones in which they wanted to use uh, either the first or the second bomb on. Separately, there was the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, who definitely opposed bombing Kyoto for a couple of reasons. And they eventually, you know, came to real disagreement on this, where there's this wonderful moment in which Groves meets with the Secretary of War, and the Secretary of War says, I want to know what the targets are. And Groves says, essentially, that's not your job. <laughs> that's the job of the military to figure out who what we bar what we bomb. And Stimson said, uh, no, it's not. This is my job, and I'm going to go all the way to the president if I have to. And this leads to sort of a, a really epic 
discussion of what the philosophy of targeting is. And this is not just a discussion about what city, it's a discussion about who makes that determination. And so this is the kind of thing uh, that, again, there's a lot of levels here that this is playing out at. And maybe this is be the historian of science in me in particular. Historians of science really like to know who knows what, who makes decisions, and to really try and not take for granted that these things are worked out ahead of time. But but uh, there's a lot that's getting uh, figured out about what the nature of the bomb is at the same time that they're contemplating using it. They don't know this yet. That narrative is going to get uh, written by their actions, and they're somewhat aware of this fact. But I want to touch back on, on Stimson, because he's a pretty interesting character here, particularly with the kind of mythos that's grown around the, the not bombing, I guess you'd say, of Kyoto. Because I, I think the popular conception is that the United States, we can talk about who makes this decision in just a second, but you know the, the popular notion is that the United States chose not to bomb Kyoto uh, kind of out of humanitarian and kind of high-minded enlightenment ideals, kind of saying like, uh, you know, we recognize it as the cultural center of Japan and therefore, you know, we would not do something so atrocious. But, uh, you know, it seems like uh, Stimson had some more kind of, you know, realpolitik, kind of more hard-nosed reasons for not wanting to bomb it. Although, you know, I'm certain that factored in. You know, could you tell us a little bit more about Stimson's opposition to bombing Kyoto and why it was a target to begin with, I guess you'd say? Yeah, it's a really tricky issue because Stimson is, uh, you know, how do we know it? it this, this gets at one of these sort of fundamentally difficult historical processes, which is how do you get inside the head of somebody else? How do you get inside the head of a dead person based on some scraps they've written down or other people have written down? So we have Stimson's explicit justifications to other people about why he didn't want to bomb Kyoto. And they seem to vary a bit with depending on who he's talking to. And then there's also arguments that have been made about you know, maybe deeper psychological reasons behind why Simpson didn't want to do it. But uh, so Simpson didn't want to bomb Kyoto. Kyoto was on the list of maybe being the city that would be first targeted uh, with the atomic bomb. It was definitely a major target as far as the military was concerned. And they did a lot of work to establish that it would be a great target from a military point of view. Uh, and their argument was that it had a lot of industries that had been moved there because they had been um, in cities that had been otherwise bombed, like Tokyo. It, they were constructing a major aircraft engine plant. So if you want to argue that the industry has a military connection, the military thought you could do that. It was a really great target from a if, – if your goal is to sort of horrify the Japanese, uh, bombing one of their major cities, major old – you know, cultural centers. Uh, that's a great way to do it. Uh, and Stimson came down very hard on this. And so the, the argument he gave to Truman was twofold. One was humanitarian. Uh, he said, this is a, a civilian target. It doesn't have any military value. Uh, again, the common mythos sort of often accepts Stimson's argument on this, though the military at the time very much disagreed. Uh, they didn't see a lot of difference between it and a city like Hiroshima, which both had military and civilian components. He also said to Truman, look, we're going to have to deal with the Japanese after the war is over. We're going to have to occupy them, and they're going to have to be uh, an ally of ours against the Soviet Union. They're going to be a way for us to uh, deal with them. Uh, we don't want to overly antagonize them by doing something that they might regard as an atrocity because you want them to immediately switch from being our enemy to being our ally and to not be sympathetic to communist arguments or propaganda. And so that's the sort of real politique, going to Truman and saying, well, if we do this now, it might put us in a bad position later. And that was apparently effective with Truman. It's a tricky thing, and 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 we can talk more about this if you want. Uh, to then ask, we're, we're already. Uh, oh, and, and one other thing, Stimson's other motivations. Uh, Stimson had been to Kyoto. He had been he, when he was in the uh, work for President uh, Herbert Hoover. He had visited Japan and the Philippines. He had been Governor General of the Philippines, and so he had visited Kyoto. There's a story that says he had his honeymoon there. Um, that's. Very, been very hard to verify, uh, but he definitely visited. We have his diary entries from the 1920s, and he said he liked Kyoto um, a lot, and it's a very pretty city. He clearly had some sort of personal connection to it and thought it was 
you know, a cultural site worth preserving. And that might be a, uh, a not, that's not the argument he used with somebody like Truman or Groves, but it's difficult to suss out, you know, what exactly motivated him. He posed it in terms of a very strict contrast between a military and a civilian target and the consequences of bombing a civilian target, which gets you to the next question, which is how did Truman understand it? What appealed to Truman? And again, you have the same problem of trying to figure out what was going on in this person's brain, this person that's not around now. And even if they were around now, it would be tricky to get that out because as we know, it's 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 very hard to connect to people who – uh, or even in the same room with you, much less have been dead for, you know, 30 years. This is important, this kind of dichotomy between, you know, a purely civilian versus a purely military target. It seems to be kind of an, an important one, you know, to kind of the popular conception of, of the of the atomic bombings of Japan and the fact that it's seen as is saying, well, you know, we the United States did the best they could to really pick out, uh, you know, some targets that were really military but, you know, looking at some of these behind the scenes conversations, it seems like at the same time that, you know, while this conversation was going on and the justifications being made that say, you know, no bomb this place because it has heavy industry that's supporting the war effort. You know, there are also conversations saying like, you know, this bomb will cause maximum damage to you know civilian housing, as, as well as a parallel conversation about trying to preserve c- certain cities from conventional bombing in order to get kind of, I guess, a, a more dramatic impact of the debut of the bomb so if you go over and this has been declassified for a while now the uh the meetings of this group called the target committee and this was a group composed of uh, military people um some very high level scientists and some more sort of policy advisorish type people and they were the ones who really hammered out, what are we going to do with this bomb? So they started building the bomb. The, the decision to actually build atomic bombs was made in late 1942. The whole operation got rolling in 1943. And they knew it was going to be a while until they had them. So they didn't do a lot of discussions at that time about what they're going to do with it if they get one. Um, come the end of 1944, early 1945, they suddenly have a, a schedule that tells them that they're going to have a couple bombs ready by the summer. And they better know what to do with them, right? You can't just sort of willy-nilly go about doing them. So they start having a lot of meetings, figuring out, okay, so what are we going to drop them on? By that point, Germany is out of the uh, picture. Um, They were not ever really thinking they were likely going to have them ready to use against Germany unless things went, you know, really poorly. So they're looking at Japan and they're saying, what what are we going to do with this bomb? Uh, Interestingly, in 1943, when they were first planning and just sort of musing about what to do with it, Uh, The initial idea they had for a target was a place called Truck, which is basically the Japanese equivalent of Pearl Harbor. Uh, So that's a base that's uh, almost entirely military. If you wanted to say a real military target, you could say that. You could say about Pearl Harbor, too. Pearl Harbor, you know, as terrible as an attack it was, almost no civilian casualties. The only civilian casualties primarily at Pearl Harbor that you get are civilian casualties involved with things like uh, our anti-aircraft fire misses its target and lands in in you know one of the more civilian areas. So you, you could say if you're making a distinction between military and civilian targets, which they do at the time, that would be a real military target, right? It, you'd, you'd be knocking out a base and a bunch of people who signed up to be in the war, not you know women and children, not the elderly, uh, people like that. Uh, by 1945, truck has been isolated and is no longer important. Uh, There aren't a lot of targets of that nature in Japan. But in any case, by that point, the United States has already, starting in the spring of 1945, begun policies of uh, pretty indiscriminate bombings. So they've they've gone away from attempts at, say, pinpointing an individual factory uh, or individual, uh, you know, military installation. And they've started firebombing, carpet bombing, things of that nature, where you just say, we'll just destroy a percentage of the city. Uh, We're not going to make big distinctions between civilians and military because it's A, tactically hard to actually hit those military targets. And B, uh, we're saying the civilians are working in the war industries, thus they're valid targets. So when they're planning the atomic bomb, from the beginning of those discussions in the spring of 1945, their ideal target is... A city, they, the, the term they use for this is a, is a large urban area or a built-up urban area. And that's, that's sort of code for city uh, that has some sort of military target in it. 
And they put military in quotation marks here in scare quotes, which I find really, it's not me retrospectively saying they're describing it as a quote, military target. They are describing it as that. And this is with an eye towards justification. They think that just bombing civilians probably going to be seen as a really terrible thing. And they already, there are members in the American political establishment that are already pretty queasy about the firebombing. Uh, Stimson, again, the Secretary of War, tells Truman that if they continue to bomb indiscriminately, like they've been bombing Tokyo, they will get a reputation for outdoing Hitler and atrocities. So that's a very strong moral, you know, it's not that everybody in the American government or or war uh, didn't see a distinction there between targeting civilians and targeting military. But the goal to bomb is you want to pick a target that's going to be big enough to showcase its effects. You don't want to drop it on some little base. You don't want to have it in a situation where you might miss. And we we tend to think of the bomb as like, how could you miss? But if you're off by uh, half a mile, which is pretty easy to do with the bombing accuracy of the day, then a lot of the effects could go on, you know, the the worst of the effects might miss whatever you're aiming at. And they might decide that it's not a very dangerous weapon after all. And they want one that has some sort of military component that gets destroyed with the city, basically, uh, because they want it to be a spectacle. They want it to uh, shock the Japanese, potentially cause them to end the war. And from the scientist's point of view, they would like to be such a bad spectacle that people around the world say, hey, this has really changed things. This isn't just a regular another weapon. This isn't just an elaboration on what came before. This is potentially a technology that should change the way in which we do politics, which is a very idealistic, very top-level sort of uh, vision about what the atomic bomb could do. But these scientists who get involved with this, many of them think that if you make it look bad, in World War II, when the weapons are still relatively small, then maybe you end all war. Maybe you change the international order. Maybe you get the countries of the world uniting to make sure that nuclear war can never happen again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These sort of very high-level idealistic approaches. So you have a lot going on, but all of it is calibrated towards it being a pretty bad experience for these cities and even at the very technical level, when they're discussing things like what height do you detonate the the, the bomb at in order to do what type of damage, uh, they're talking about it in terms of destroying civilian houses, not military barracks or something like this. So later you get an argument where people say, oh, well, they were valid military targets, blah, blah, blah. OK, well, one can argue about this in different ways, but it's just incredibly important, I think, to be very clear eyed about the fact that they were – not choosing targets that didn't happen to be in cities. I mean, their their criteria was very much about destroying cities that happened to have military targets in it because that would make it more justifiable. I suppose the, the parallel conversation here, which you've kind of touched upon when discussing how the, the scientists who were who had worked on this bomb, who had, you know, helped develop nuclear weapons, were seemed pretty cognizant of the power of these things. But I think the parallel question here is how much did people outside of that small bubble really understand? You know, was it understood by the military, perhaps some who had even witnessed these, you know, uh, test bombings? You know, how much did they understand? And really, how much did Truman, you know, who had kind of the ultimate, I guess you could say, final authority understand? Because he comes off as maybe not being quite as cognizant of the power of these new weapons. It's a really tricky question. I mean, even the scientists, what does it mean for them to understand? I mean, they've never seen what happens when... 20,000 tons of TNT goes off over a city. They had seen at one time the Trinity test. They they set off the bomb there, and they were very impressed by this. They were all very taken aback by it. Uh, It was more powerful than they had expected it to be, which is part of it. They had surveyed some places where uh, big explosives had gone off accidentally. So like the Halifax explosion or uh, during World War II, there was an accidental detonation of uh, munitions at a place called Port Chicago in California. So they studied that to see what would happen. But what does it mean to drop a bomb on a city? Even today, this is a hard thing to to really visualize, which is why I created things like the nuke map. Uh, These are orders of magnitude beyond what we thankfully experience on a regular basis, these kind of explosions. And even the scientists were wrong just as an aside, about how many people would die. I mean, Oppenheimer thought it was going to be around 20,000 casualties, which is a lot of people. Let's let's be clear on that. 
when he heard that it was uh, the initial reports of the casualties were 80,000 at Hiroshima, uh, he was very, very disturbed by this. And he himself, he never ever said he regretted uh, approving, uh, uh, recommending it to the bomb be used on a city or, or building the bomb. But he did indicate uh, later that this, the the fact that there were the difference of 60,000 people or so dead uh, did matter to him, that maybe that would have affected his judgment a little bit if he had actually known what would happen. So even the scientists, the people who are supposed to know, uh, they only know so much. They haven't done this before. Truman, Truman is a really tricky historical figure. We tend to, again, exaggerate his importance in some way because he's the president and we assume the president's important. With regard to the atomic bombing, he was pretty peripheral. One way that General Groves phrased it, which I think is right, is he said that Truman could have stopped the bombing, uh, but he didn't approve it. I mean, he was never asked, should we do this? He was told, we're going to do this. Um, and Truman's one role would have been to see it sort of be an intervention. Uh, and he, he clearly didn't do that. He wasn't interested in doing that uh, at the beginning at all. Uh, but he wasn't he wasn't considered to be it wasn't considered to be in play that Truman wouldn't want to drop the bomb. Uh Truman was briefed on the atomic bomb right after Roosevelt died. There's actually a really great description that Groves gives about trying to get Truman to understand it because Truman was not uh, deeply interested in the details. Truman, I would just point out, is the last American president we've had who had no college education. And it's a theme throughout his presidency that he's not at all interested in science and technology at any deep level. I mean, Truman's understanding of military technology is essentially rooted in World War I, uh, which is where he fought. He considered the, the atomic bomb in the terms of these sort of giant artillery guns that were used to siege Paris – uh, in World War One, uh, which is you know still orders of magnitude smaller than an atomic bomb, a little difference. And in fact, Groves goes to him with this report that they've condensed, which is basically the atomic bomb 101. Right? What is it? How have we made it? What is it going to do? And I think the total report is maybe 16 pages in a pretty big font face, you know, typeface, typewriter, double space sort of thing. If we put it in Microsoft Word today, it probably would run five or six pages. And Truman basically says, I don't want to read this. Just tell me what's in it. And Groves actually says, I'm sorry, you actually have to read this. You have to read it word for word. This is too important to just give you a prissy five-minute version of it. And so he forces the president, which is just a great image of the general, this large general forcing Truman to do his homework, right, to read it over. And Truman says, okay, I understand. Uh, how much does Truman understand? I don't know. Truman – when you look at his statements, when you look at his diary entries, journal entries, you look at even interviews he gives later, his level of understanding of what was going to happen has a lot of gaps in it. There isn't any evidence that I've been able to found that prior to getting the news from the Japanese about casualties, which comes in on August 8th or so uh, to the White House, and it's not clear exactly when Truman read this, but probably by August 9th, that he understood that Hiroshima was going to produce a lot of civilian casualties. Uh, it's not clear he understood how many casualties at all were involved. He seemed to be pretty disturbed by the fact that it killed many uh, non-combatants, women and children is the phrase that he uses um, uh, repeatedly. You know, the bombs are weapons. He initially says after Hiroshima that he doesn't want to use a weapon that'll kill women and children. When he agrees to not bomb Kyoto. He says uh, in his, he writes in his own journal to himself, we're going to pick a military target. We won't kill women and children unless we have to, uh, which scholars have puzzled over because it has a real uh, indication. Either he's lying to himself or he doesn't know, or he's lying for posterity or whatever that, that Hiroshima is going to kill a lot of non-combatants. When he agrees to stop atomic bombing on August 10th, he says he doesn't want to kill any more women and children. Uh, so this is a real – like one of these – I've spent a lot of time sort of puzzling over this. At what point does Truman realize that Hiroshima is a city and not a place like truck? It's not just the military base. And the answer seems to be a few days after it gets bombed, not before, which uh, – 
in some sense makes sense if you see Truman as a guy who's not concerned with these kind of details and maybe gets confused by these discussions over what's a military target, what's a civilian target. But um, is sometimes uh, I've had some people say pretty straightforward when I've told them this this argument and given talks on this where they say, I just can't imagine a U.S. president being that you know out of touch. But even that sort of has a later – present day assumption about what it means to be a president and especially regarding nuclear weapons. But uh, Truman's really tricky, really tricky guy. One of the other things that I think is kind of that we're kind of skirting around here is, well, you know, what was the obligation of the United States to kind of notify, you know, if they knew that they were going to be dropping, you know, maybe if Truman didn't know, but if, if the military and the scientists knew that there was going to be significant amounts of civilian casualties you know what was kind of the the moral obligation of the united states to kind of give advance warning you know we have uh, in in late july you know just a few weeks before the Hiroshima and nagasaki bombings the the potsdam declaration where i think the, the united states basically said uh warn japan of prompt and utter destruction but it seems that that's a little bit vague and i think that's maybe part of the problem of trying to warn your opponent that you're going to hit them with a weapon but you can't tell them what it is you know so you know what was the obligation of the united states to say hey we're going to destroy one of your cities because i know there were some leaflet campaigns as well but that seemed a little ineffective as well so the us had a uh, what they called a psychological warfare division, which was in charge of things like leaflets. Um, so these were dropped on Jap Japanese cities. And they basically said, hey, Japan, we're going to bomb you. Here's a list of cities we might bomb in the next few days. And you should, if you're a civilian, you should run away because we really don't want to hurt you. But, you know, the uh, bombs don't have eyes, is what one of them said. They can't tell who's a civilian and who's not. So uh, we're not trying to kill civilians. We we really care about civilians, but you better get out of there. And as the division name makes clear, this isn't so much about humanitarian interest. Maybe there's a little bit of that. Uh, we don't have to totally rule it out. But the main explicit uh, idea is let's terrify the Japanese. Let's cause their workers to leave their factories if we can, because that will hurt their war effort. And they give themselves a little bit of plausible uh, justification after the fact. If there are a lot of casualties, they say, well, we warned them. It's not our fault. I don't really put a lot of stock in this as a moral policy. I mean, if you're going to be doing low altitude napalm raids on urban areas, you're going to kill a lot of civilians. And they knew this. There's no question about that. Uh, that's a if, if you choose a policy, you get a result. Could they have chose other policies? Sure. Are there ups and downs to any given policy choice? Of course, right? These are always a trade off depending on what you're going to value. And clearly, civilian lives in Japan were not something that the uh, the military uh, operators in question valued. Though, again, there was – it was never – this was a moral question. This was a moral debate that was happening at the time. It wasn't like every American hated every Japanese civilian or even that every American policy member, uh, policymaker uh, did either. Again, Stimson found this policy really disturbing and it's interesting that this policy was pursued without his approval, right? So you have the military making decisions that are contrary to what the uh, Secretary of War – uh, would like because these functions were more divided back then than they would be today where it's hard to imagine the military embarking on a campaign that would you know result in huge numbers of collateral deaths without the Department of Defense being somehow notified and approval being gotten you know did the United States have an obligation to warn uh, the Japanese uh, you know that I don't know the, this is this is to me an open question about how you want to fight wars what you think, laws of wars require and mean one thing though that is sort of my 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 most what i find to be the most irritating myth of the atomic bombings uh, there's a lot of people who believe we did one and this is just not true this is just false the potsdam declaration is not a it's not an actionable warning uh, it, it's no more an actionable warning than if a terrorist said something bad will happen unless you give us what we want. Uh, that doesn't – you can't say after the fact, you know, well, we warned you. We told you something bad would happen and I couldn't be responsible for – you know, it doesn't give anybody information that they could find useful. So that's not a, a – that they could act upon. So that's not a real warning. That's just a sort of threat. There – were leaflets created after the Hiroshima bombing. There were none created before the Hiroshima bombing, talking about 
uh, an atomic bomb. And, and, and that shouldn't be surprising. The whole thing was a secret. They aren't going to say, you know, the whole point of it was to be a big surprise shock. You can't tell somebody, hey, we're going to drop an atomic bomb on you and, and have that still be the big surprise shock. At least they didn't think so. They had no interest in warning them. After Hiroshima, there were some leaflets put together with the idea being that you could, again, use this to – you'd be integrating the atomic bomb into your psychological warfare. So the leaflets said, hey, we just blew up Hiroshima with a new weapon, just FYI. Uh, we, we have the capability to do this. You better be totally afraid. For a variety of logistical reasons, they didn't get these ready to use or to – well, they didn't drop any of these until after the Nagasaki bombing. Uh, they made one after Hiroshima. They were about to get it all printed up and ready to go. Uh, then the Soviets invaded Manchuria and so they wanted to revise the leaflet, so they changed it. Uh, then the second atomic bomb went off, so they revised you know that again. Anyway, um, Nagasaki – this is one of the grimmer ironies of it, got a warning leaflets about the atomic bomb the day after it was atomic bombed, which is, you know, shows you as much as there is to show about how well coordinated all this was. Should we have given them warning in that way? I don't know, but we definitely did not. It's, I, I don't know if it matters. Um, I mean, Again, the analogy I always use is what if a terrorist did it today to us? What if a terrorist said, I'm going to blow up one of a, a big building in one of 10 major American cities, so you better just flee? We wouldn't expect people to, to flee en masse. And if they did it, we'd still hold them accountable. We wouldn't say, well, they did warn us. Uh, it, it, it doesn't strike me as a, a moral assertion that, uh, uh, as uh, they say, has a, a real uh, – it's not a categorical imperative. You can't apply it to all situations and have it worked out. Mm -hmm. There were conventional bombing leaflets, apparently, that had Hiroshima and maybe Nagasaki listed as possible targets. And this has been a question of whether they were really warned. I've actually never been able to find one of those. I've seen a lot of leaflets, and I've never found one that said Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Doesn't mean it didn't exist. They printed up lots of different types of leaflets. But again, I don't find that to actually be much of a warning. While a lot of those arguments apply you know, kind of very directly to Hiroshima, we see with, with Nagasaki, and particularly with that kind of I mean, that's the most, I mean, that's almost, it seems like almost insult to injury to drop leaflets saying, hey, be careful of the bomb after you've just bombed, you know, nuclear bombed a city. But were there discussions behind the scenes about, you know, why not delay after Hiroshima and let kind of that full effect kind of sink in? You know, was, what was, what was the rush to go drop another bomb? You know, was this as, uh, because the Russians had finally invaded Manchuria or were there, were there other forces kind of pushing this, uh, pushing it down the road kind of saying, you know, let's hurry up and do this? Yeah. The scheduling of the bombs is one of the really interesting historical questions. And it's one of these ones, and this is, uh, I guess as the historian, one of the things I engage with when I talk with people online a lot and in general public, people sort of have these uh, backward rationales. And so the, the backward rationale for Hiroshima and Nagasaki is, well, you want to give them a one-two punch really quickly. They didn't respond after Hiroshima. So you had to emphasize that we had another one, that we had more than one bomb. And that's why Nagasaki had to have it happen you know, the way it did. Uh, this is completely unrelated to the actual historical thinking that was going on at the time. Uh, we tend to wonder, okay, so there was, there must've been a big strategy, right? Because they used two atomic bombs. There are only three days separating them. What's the big strategy? There wasn't a big strategy. That's the big sort of historical reveal. It's not even clear that Truman knew there was a second bomb ready to be used. Uh, that's a whole other what did Truman know and not know question. But I found zero indication in anything that he wrote that he realized there would be two bombs ready by the early August. He knew that there would be another plutonium bomb by the end of August. But I've never seen anything where he seems to understand there was a whole other type of bomb, the uranium bomb. He was mostly briefed on the plutonium bomb. When he writes about atomic bombs in his journal, in his journal, he's talking exclusively about plutonium bombs, and you can tell that based on some technical information he, he he's been told. He says at one point, thirteen pounds of of fuel uh, set this off. That's the plutonium bomb. There's much more in the uranium bomb. It wasn't a top level decision. In fact, the the order which Truman didn't give, but he saw it. But it's a military order from one general to another general saying drop atomic bombs basically has a lot of detail on the first bomb. The first bomb should be dropped on or about August 3rd. 
and it should be dropped on one of these four targets, Hiroshima, uh, Kokura, Niigata, Nagasaki, and uh, uh, has to be dropped with visual bombing. Lots of, you know, you have to be able to see the target. Don't just use radar to figure out where it is. Uh, lots of information. And then, then it says, as you get more bombs, you'll, you can drop those. And if you run out of targets, we'll tell you more targets, right? So, like, it sort of is a really open-ended uh, order, but that's sort of the, like, um, it, it, the open-endedness is, is is kind of profoundly understated, right? It's a lot of detail about one, and then just, yeah, yeah, drop more as you get, as you get them. It's just a coincidence of production that they had two bombs ready to use in early August. The scheduling, again, originally the idea was you drop one around August 3rd, then you drop another one around August 10th. And then you'd have another one by August 24th or something like that. As it turned out, the the decision about when exactly to drop it, though, was determined by the people uh, who were going to be dropping the bomb, the people on the island of Tinian in the South Pacific. And they had all these operational conditions to take into effect, uh, most important of which in bombing Japan was weather. Uh, the weather systems in Japan in late summer are pretty volatile. There can be a lot of clouds. And if you need visual confirmation that you are aiming at the right thing, you have to have pretty clear skies uh, and they can change hour to hour. So they had bad weather forecasts up until August 6th. And so they delayed the first bomb until then. And then they had another weather forecast that said August 10th was going to have bad weather. So they pushed the second bomb up to August 9th. So there wasn't a big strategy about three days being between. Initially, it was meant to be an entire week, which is a pretty a more reasonable amount of time, I think, for figuring out what happened and what you're going to do about it. It's entirely disconnected from like a Washington high strategy view. It's entirely about weather forecasts made by military people at the very lowest level. Uh, so three days, not a lot of time. And again, not for a big reason, but because of weather uh, issues. There are discussions about were they really wanting to use both types of bombs? Uh, why might the uranium and a plutonium bomb uh and we can get into that if you're interested. I've, I've written a little bit about this on the blog. But mostly it's it's about the fact that this isn't being run by some high-level strategy. There are some high-level strategy aspects of the war and even the atomic bomb. But at some point, it gets delegated to a relatively low level. And the relatively low level concerns are things like how many clouds are there in the sky. Actually, I, I kind of want to pivot a little bit because one of the things that I've been thinking about in the background here while I, while I listen to you is just kind of thinking about – you know, we know this today. It's it's more than seventy years since those these bombings, which is, I think, you know, World War Two still looms very much because it kind of created our our modern world that we still live in in a way. But it's also it's it's a long time. I mean, not in a historical sense, but you know, that's that's uh, for people. I think we're about you know roughly the same age, maybe. But you know, that's that's our grandparents' war. So when we look at this, and just knowing kind of generally, very generally, the way that you know de declassification works. You know, we can look back, or really, I should say, you can look back and do this kind of research on these declassified documents that just simply wasn't possible, you know, in the decades immediately after uh, World War II and these bombings. You know, would you have been able to do this sort of research and, you know, write this sort of, uh, of articles and books that, that, you know, you write had it been 1956 or 1966? So generally, I mean, uh, what you had in the 1940s and 1950s were participant accounts, right? So you had people writing memoirs. You had people sometimes writing big articles justifying what they did. And occasionally they would be able to release some information that had been classified. But there's a lot that they couldn't say. I mean, the, even the, the fact that the, the implosion design, this is the Nagasaki bomb and the Trinity gadget bomb, that wasn't declassified until 1951. So you couldn't have any kind of story about World War II that had any detailed information about the fact that there were two kinds of bombs. The fact that they both used different fuel was known, but the fact that that involved radically different designs, radically different amounts of fissile material, had implications for how many bombs they would have ready and at what time, things like that, that was all classified. By the 1960s, you start to get some of that stuff more declassified. You start to get um, memoirs like General Groves' memoir, which which has much more nitty-gritty detail in it. But again, you're still reliant on memoirs. You're reliant on one participant's versions of things. And even the most honest participant 
even assuming they have no ulterior agendas, and General Groves has lots of agendas. General Groves is a, is Mr. Agenda, right? Uh, but even assuming they had no agendas, they're always going to be shaped by how the past you know 20 years or so have caused them to rethink what was going on at the time. They know the bombs ended the war, so they're going to – they have no uncertainty about their actions and things like that. Whereas if you go through the actual documents, you find that they don't know uh, – uh, shockingly, they don't know what the future is going to be. Uh, you get a very different view of things. By the mid-70s, you start to have a lot of archival documents declassified. So you do get this kind of resurgence of new accounts, which are much more detailed, that go into some of these issues much more closely. Uh, you get books by the mid-80s, like Richard Rhodes is making the atomic bomb. You get uh, a, a sort of revisionist school, which is starting to really question a lot of the myths that have grown up uh, with guys like Garl Perovitz or Martin Sherwin. These uh, sort of the late 80s is kind of the the real renaissance in which there's enough stuff declassified, enough time has passed that you can actually start to dig into the details. And a lot of those people were still alive at that point. So you still can get that participant account if you want it, even though they're pretty elderly. And I would say the bulk of the Manhattan Project stuff, the uh, a lot of that was declassified by the mid to late 70s, definitely by the mid 80s, and definitely by the early 1990s after the Cold War ended. There has been uh, some new declassifications in the last, say, 10, 15 years. Most of these haven't changed, I think, the fundamental story. The changes that you see to the story are more about people asking different questions now as opposed to having new documents. Occasionally, there's a new document. Occasionally, there's something that it gives you a little bit of wrinkle of detail or a, a little bit of a slant of, of view. But very few things have come out in, say, the last 15 years that I think have radically changed. You know, they're, 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 No smoking gun has come out where people go, oh, my God, now that we have this document, everything has changed. Most of it is about – not even so much reinterpretation. There's a lot of similarity of interpretation. But if you ask a different question, if the question you're asking isn't uh, something like, uh, were the atomic bombs justified? That's the classic question of the 1980s, right? 1990s. That's the question they care about. That points you in certain directions. If the question you're asking is instead, and this is, of course, the question I like to ask, what did Truman know and not know? Then you start looking in different places. If the question is, why did Truman seem to think that women and children wouldn't die uh, in, in at Hiroshima? I mean, that's almost an unaskable question in the 1980s. They kind of assume, of course he knows, right? But if you ask that now, you start chasing down a whole different lines of sources. And many of these have been declassified for a long time. Like I've, uh, I have a bunch of speeches that uh, Truman gave a speech on August 9th about the atomic bomb uh, in which he says at one point, the world will take note that the first target was Hiroshima, a military base, uh, and and thus we spared women and children or something along those lines. And you think, OK, that's a really interesting line since by then he ought to know that that is not the case, right? that it's a city that has a base in it and lots of women and children did die. Who wrote that press release? Who wrote that speech? And you can go to the Truman Archive. I just – basically emailed them and had them photocopy a lot of things. And you can find, okay, it was a guy in his office who, was a, uh, who wrote a lot of his speeches. And you can see him corresponding with another person in the State Department, guy, uh, who, who was also a poet, interestingly, li the Librarian of Congress, uh, Alistair McLeish, was giving him a lot of the language that he used on the atomic bomb. And you can see exactly what day they started adding in certain language because there's multiple drafts. And so that's just a whole different line of inquiry. What What's interesting is not that there's a new source. That source has probably been in the Truman Library for 30 years. But as far as I can tell, uh, it, it hasn't really been looked at because that's not the question anybody was asking previously. So if you ask a different question, you start getting different answers. And some of those answers can double back and impact those big questions, like, again, the justification. If Truman doesn't know what he's bombing, if he doesn't realize what's going to happen, what does that do to our understanding about the justification of the bombs and this argument about how important they were strategically, et cetera? Etc. Et so this is a different – the declassification matters. You can't do it without the sources. But it's the combination of the sources and the interpretive lens that gives you sort of uh, new insights. 
But of course, your work doesn't simply, you know, begin and end with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You, know, you study specifically the United States nuclear policy and development and armament and you know technology, almost kind of as a whole. I mean, of course, you know, this early period looms very high. But you know, in in your research, do you, as you go further, you know, into close, coming closer to our, our modern day, do you find yourself kind of stymied by some of these these uh, nuclear documents, which are still uh, restricted data? I believe is the the term that is used for kind of the presumed everything uh, to do with the, the nuclear program is presumed top secret to begin with. You know, do you find yourself stymied in your research going forward? And, you know, do you find yourself thinking that, you know, maybe in 10 years, I'll be able to research this more fully? It's a big question. Just as an aside, I almost purposely avoided topics like Hiroshima and Nagasaki when I started off, even with the blog, because I thought, these have been done to death. What am I going to be able to say that's new about this? And then I kept getting drawn back to them because it turns out, A, uh, there's a lot that hasn't been talked about, or at least there's there's more talking to do. And B, people love it. So you know, if you're interested in in doing interesting things and engaging with a larger audience, you end up coming back to Hiroshima and Nagasaki again and again. Uh, yeah. So my work, my my dissertation, uh, which is someday going to be a book, God, if I knew when, covers. It's meant to cover nuclear secrecy from 1939, which is even before the Manhattan Project really exists, up and through. Uh, I think the dissertation ended in 2008 in its scope, but I don't know what the book will do. If it'll how much closer to the present. You'll get, and as you can imagine, there's way more. The, the the parts of it are that are from the 1940s and the 1950s are way more detailed, right, than the parts from say the 1990s, where most of the stuff is still classified. There's a, a they they generally don't even consider trying to declassify stuff for about three decades. You can make requests through the Freedom of Information Act, and occasionally you'll get something. But if something involves present day policies, present day officials people who are still alive, they're much more reticent to give you the information on a lot of either security or sometimes even just privacy grounds. So you could imagine the, the, the work as having a sort of gradient of how many documents I have that are insider accounts as opposed to you know public statements or interviews or something. And of course, it's extremely dense in the past and it gets much uh, less dense as we get closer to the present. But this gets back to what I'm saying. The documents help. They definitely do. And some of the stuff I've done, say, even for the 1970s, would be impossible to write the version that I wrote without the fact that I filed a Freedom of Information Act request. So I have a whole section of the dissertation slash book uh, that is about a technology called laser fusion, which uh, there was it was developed in uh, in the private sector in the late 1960s, and they were uh, a bunch of private uh, industrial scientists were trying to get patents on it, and the government tried to shut them down in the 1970s, saying that this was classified technology because it has a very similar physics to how a thermonuclear weapon works. It involves compressing a very small pellet of fusion uh, fuel using a gigantic laser, uh, and there's similar physics to how H-bombs work in that, hydrogen bombs. And then it turns out that the government was secretly working on this in the 1950s, but nobody knew about that because it was secret. So there's all this interesting stuff going on where it doubles back on itself. The secrecy becomes uh, a part of the story uh, in the 70s as well, uh, definitely now. And a lot of that technology and a lot of these documents were still classified. And I was able to – I filed a Freedom of Information Act request in, I don't know, probably 2000. Five and I got a huge amount of documents by 2008 and even more by 2010. And so I got more and more information as time went on. And this was immensely helpful. And I couldn't have told that story without the documents. On the other hand, I still could have told a story without the documents because the documents give you some insight into things. They're never going to give you everything. And you're never going to have all the documents, even for topics that don't have secrecy. So if we had a medieval historian on here and I said, so have you gotten all the documents? I mean, they would laugh, they'd laugh you out of the building, right? Because they never have all the documents. So there's always source limitations. What makes it frustrating from a, uh, uh, in this realm is that you know the documents do exist. It's not a matter of them having all been burned down when the Library of Alexandria got torched, right? They're there. They're in an archive. You probably guess where they are. I've even seen versions of them, but they have a big they have chunks missing or sometimes the whole thing will be redacted except for the title or something. Uh, so there's a different relationship there between the historian and the archive than you might have with a lot of topics. Though even then, my 
historian friends of other fields would point out that like it's not like the archives are always all that cooperative anyway, even on topics that aren't secret, that there's all sorts of issues involved. Will it change the story in the future? I hope so. Geez, that would keep some jobs security out there for other historians in the future. I'm not trying to, and I can't try to, uh, claim that I'm going to rewrite the authoritative history of this for all time. Uh, there's going to be things that come out that would change the story. I hope there are. I hope in 20 years somebody writes the book that explains why my book was stupid and I was wrong, whatever, right? This is what I'm doing. I'm writing books explaining that historians of 20 years ago are wrong in their understanding based on either new documents or new interpretive frameworks that I'm using today. That's fine. That's how history works. Uh, you do the best you can. I never try to be reliant on anything I might find in any one source. You can often – uh, learn a lot by even the blank spaces. Things have been declassified over time where I have five versions of a document that have each been declassified at different periods. And I know there's still stuff missing, but seeing what's interesting to the censor over time is itself part of my object of study, figuring out how that changes. And it does allow me to say, okay, I have a general idea for example, of like what's still classified based on what sections are always being dropped out of documents. And I can guess what kind of range of things might be in there. Do I know what's in there? No. So for me as the historian, part of the goal is uh, this forces you to be clever and creative about how you use sources. But it also forces you to be really honest with your reader, with other historians. Uh, And this is something that I think not all historians of this topic uh, do to the degree that I would like them to do. But to say very explicitly, here's what I know, here's what I don't know. Here are the limits of my interpretation. Here's where I'm taking a jump. Here's where I'm basing this on something that was written in a source that I have. I don't see any problem with being excruciatingly honest about this, at least in your footnotes, if it doesn't screw up the the story you're trying to tell. And I think it's all for the better to to do this sort of thing where I can say, look, here's the general story. Here's what I see. Uh, Do I see everything? God, no. But I can see a bunch, and here's my evidence for what I do see and what I think I see. When we start to get up to the present, I'm not so much telling you – I can't tell you what's going on behind the scenes. But I can tell you with what what I know about what went behind the scenes in the decades previous, what that lends uh, me to believe about what might be happening today or where there are parallels or, or things going together. I'd like to kind of nudge us towards a, a conclusion here. So just as kind of an epilogue to what we've been talking about – you had mentioned that you had not wanted to be the the Hiroshima and Nagasaki guy amongst all of the dozens and dozens and dozens of other Hiroshima and Nagasaki guys, uh, and but that you kind of got drawn into it because there is uh, this you know this very popular fascination on it. Now, you of course run uh, Nuclear Secrecy, uh, blog.nuclearsecrecy.com. If anyone wants to go to it, uh, we'll put a link in the discussion post. But you know, you very much are engaged in kind of popular outreach. You know, as is both kind of uh, for nuclear science technology, but also for history. Uh, you know, what do you think is the role of of you know the academic historian to reach out to the public, even if it ends up that you know you end up talking not about you know, laser fusion like you want to, but you end up finding yourself talking about topics that bring come up in the popular imagination like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I don't I don't generally want to be, you know, too prescriptive for other historians, both because I don't want them to be prescriptive for me, but also because there's a lot of different types of scholar out there. And I know a lot of people who have no interest in talking about things that other people are interested in. They want to carve out their part of history and they want to do a really deep dive and they don't want what you know the the quote unquote public and I don't think there's one public there's lots of publics uh there's lots of different audiences and that's a that's a this is always like first thing I tell somebody who's interested in talking to a broader public is figure out which public you're interested in talking to uh cuz not all publics care about all topics but there's a lot of people who think oh if you engage with the general public or, or broader audiences, you're ended up only answering the questions they care about. And of course, they don't always care about the questions that are, uh, from an academics uh, viewpoint, the most important or the most interesting. They rehash a lot of the same topics, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's actually totally valid view. I don't have any problem with saying that there's a place for scholarship. There's a place for the ivory tower in its worst sort of 
sense where you're not engaged with the rest of the world and that's okay because uh, sometimes engagement will will cause you to not follow topics that later prove to be fruitful. Um, I'm interested in the nuclear stuff and the secrecy stuff and the atomic bomb stuff for both sort of very esoteric academic reasons, right? I can give the standard, uh, you know, if I was talking to very esoteric historians of science who only cared about theoretical justifications within their own discipline, I have a version of describing what I do that fits in very well, which is about the uh, secrecy as the sort of uh, anti-dissemination of knowledge. Uh, usually historians of science care about how knowledge is made and circulated. Well, this is the opposite of that. What happens if you try to contain it? So that's a nice, interesting theoretical framework to think about secrecy. Uh, but it is also a topic that has a huge amount of uh, a general interest and general topic, you know, general audiences have a lot of active questions about it. What I like to do if I can do it in my best of selves, in my best version of myself, is to say that I, I'm willing to tackle a question that is uh, a lot of historians, academic historians would say, oh, that's, that's the wrong question or it's been done to death or it's been asked before a million ways. Just go read this book. It'll answer it. You know, um, I'm willing to try to take a fresh look at it. And I found over time that if you do that and you're, you know, willing to sort of go down paths that have been gone down before, you find that the major book on the topic, right, or one of the books on the, or, or, or maybe it didn't cover that question all the way, or maybe it has things open-ended, or maybe even in its worst, let's say let's, the, the other scholars have totally answered this question 100%. The act of trying to reframe it in a way so that your general audience person sees that, oh, this actually has considerable depth. This has considerable contingency is a word we really like uh, as historians, right? It, the History didn't have to just be the one way that you're used to it being. Uh, if I can use that as a venue for pushing somewhat more uh, nuanced and sophisticated ways of thinking about history, that's fun for me I, in my ideal form. I like to imagine it's fun for the general audience. And it does serve this purpose of helping the world see that history isn't it isn't uh, uh, just like how the History Channel does it, which I, I've been on the History Channel. I'm not like a total hater, even though a lot of what they do is pretty superficial. It's nothing to do with history these days. You know, it. W we have a version of history, which is there's a bunch of facts and you put them in the right order and that's history. And that's that's so divorced from what academic history is and the study of history. You have a huge generations of people, including people my generation, who have gone through these awful high school history classes. I think high school is really the uh, the altar at which history gets sacrificed on, where it becomes this sort of memory game, right? Can you memorize a bunch of facts so you can take a test, so you can get a score, so you don't have to take more history in college, right? This is kind of the argument. And I think this is insane. I mean, that that version of history has nothing to do with the actual scholarly study of history. And it takes... Uh, my wife's a high school teacher, uh, not of that sort of history, just as an aside. And she once had a, a student who visited a bunch of colleges, and the student came back and said, well, the problem, you know, one of the interesting things is we were at a group with a bunch of other, you know, potential students at this college, uh, uh, potential college students, and they asked, what's your favorite subject? And the student of my wife said, my favorite subject is history. And everyone else in the room like revolted, you know, reacted with horror. Like they had said, my favorite subject is getting a dental cleaning or something like that, right? Or it's, oh, how could you, so boring. And he came back and he said, why did they say that? And my wife had to say, she's a very good teacher. He said, well, most of them don't do history the way that we do it. That, that they don't do it at, at, a, at a high level discussion and really thinking about what it means to know something and what the past is really like. They do it as a memorization game. So- I think there's a general I, – I don't think you can make an argument that's persuasive against general outreach, assuming it's good and not just sort of history channel-like uh, oversimplifying. I, I'm glad to take part in that. I find it rewarding both as a sort of public service, but I find it rewarding as a scholar because sometimes these questions do get us to reexamine things and they do get us to find new things. Some of these topics like this work I'm doing on Truman come out of having talked – 
even on Ask Historians, with people who ask these kind of questions that I think a lot of historians might dismiss these as naive questions. But if you take them really seriously and you start thinking, well, how would I answer that for real and not just like appeal to his memoirs, which is a pretty lazy move? Uh, how would I really get to the bottom of that? You start going down avenues that are actually very fruitful for the for even the the academics academic, uh, much less somebody who's interested in engaging a lot of your audience. Well, Dr. Wellestein, I want to thank you so much for doing a little outreach and enlightening us here. Oh, I'm happy to be part of it. And again, if people want to uh, read me go on and on as well, they can go to nuclearsecrecy.com, which is where I, I post pretty much everything I'm up to. And eventually someday they'll read your book. Oh, God, I hope so. <laughs> And as always, a big thanks to all of our listeners and a special big thanks to our Patreon subscribers. Uh, you also can be a Patreon supporter of the show and of Ask Historians uh, by going to patreon.com forward slash Ask Historians. A, a special thanks to 40k Freak uh, for their generous support of the podcast. Uh, it would figure that, you know, we put in a little clause that, if, you know, you donate enough, we'll say your name in the air. And of course, the first person to get that would be 40k Freak. So 40k Freak. 40k freak 40k freak uh thank you so much for your support in the meantime i hope you do actually get a chance uh to finally eventually read alex's book perhaps if we all put a lot of um very gentle i wouldn't say pressure but support and love and admiration towards him uh he will um find the time and the publisher to get out that all together in the meantime you really should go to nuclearsecrecy.com and just read up on everything he's uh, he's been writing there. Uh, there's just years of materials covering just about, just about any aspect of uh, nuclear weapons, but you know, with a focus on kind of you know American nuclear weapons because the uh, United States has a lot of bombs. It's a fascinating blog you can really easily get lost in. So nuclearsecrecy.com, all one word, but except for the dot com. Uh, so nuclear secrecy one word.com you know how the internet works i shouldn't have to explain this so go there uh, read up on it i'll link it in the discussion post that we're going to put up on ask historians i'll also link to a couple of other pieces that uh, I'll, I'll probably at least link to this piece on nagasaki that alex wrote uh, i think last year i'll have to check but um it was one of the pieces that he suggested i read in advance of, of our conversation today and it really is a great piece uh, it's called nagasaki the last bomb and it was in the New Yorker that, <laughs> I mean, it's a small thing compared to the Ask a Storm podcast. So I hope you enjoyed today's podcast uh, and really just the way that Alex can just take the subject and just run with it. Um, he really has not just a, an amazing amount of things to say about, uh, you know, nuclear weapons and the history of science and technology, but also, uh, he, I mean, you can really sell that he has kind of a, that spirit of the educator in him. Um, but anyway, I hope you got from this episode just a, a better understanding of not just how the decisions to drop the bombs and, you know, how and just decisions of how to drop the bombs were formulated back in World War II. Uh, and also kind of the problems uh, that we kind of skated around and touched on, but, you know, didn't really come to a firm answer on about kind of the, the moral culpability of these things, because it's one of those <laughs> it is one of those things that I don't think it's ever going to be a settled argument Maybe in the hindsight of history, uh, we will be judged harshly. Maybe we will be not, uh, as you know, as I say, we as the United States nation. But uh, and who knows? Uh, it'll be an interesting subject to see how it pans out, and we can definitely see how, is particularly with nuclear weapons and top secret technology, it, sometimes it does take decades for the the truth to pan out. So uh, I hope we can bring Alex back in a couple years when he will finally reveal to us what actually is going on a project, uh, uh, what's actually going on in Area 51. I'm sure he knows. Until then, in two weeks, uh, we're actually going to do uh, our next couple episodes are going to be kind of a, a back-to-back kind of Italy special, I guess you could say. Our next episode in two weeks is going to focus on communal Italy. That's kind of, I, I wasn't really familiar with the term before I started researching uh, for the for this for our podcast, but it would be kind of familiar. It, it's the period kind of in the early 1100s to, you know, early 1300s, kind of, you know, the medieval, early medieval period in Italy, particularly in Northern Italy, when a lot of these city-states, uh, which would come to define the Italian peninsula for centuries afterwards, and even kind of define its identity today as as a nation, which kind of is not very national when it comes down to it. 
So we'll talk about that in two weeks. And then two weeks after that, we're going to talk about uh, Italian fascism and football. And that is, of course, uh, Italian football or European football or the football that the rest of the world calls football, uh, except for America and the good old socceroos down under. Uh, Or as the Italians call it, calcio, because we're Italian. And we're going to talk about how uh, Italian fascists try to use football as a means to weld together uh, an Italian national spirit. So uh, we'll uh, we'll spend the next month on vacation in Italy. And I hope you will enjoy it then. So we will see you in two weeks. In the meantime, uh, please do go to our patreon.com forward slash ask historians and give us money so we can keep making the shows. Um, I promise we actually do have some plans to start doing something with the surplus, uh, but we just need to kind of iron out the details. In the meantime, uh, you can also go to uh, reddit.com forward slash r forward slash ask historians, where we put up a discussion post uh, for each one of those episodes. So if you have any questions about the guest, uh, for our guest about the, the topic today, or if you have any questions to me about the podcast in general, then feel free to go there and ask them. Um, those stay open for a long, long time. And I know that these are long episodes, so you probably don't get to listen to them right away, then rush over to Reddit to ask questions. Um, but yeah, you can go in there. You can, you can if it's been weeks or months past, you could feel free to, don't feel embarrassed to go ask a question much later, um, because they will get to uh, our guest, and they will get to me, and, and they will get answered. So we'll see you in two weeks. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at AskHistorians and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com Thank you very much for listening and join us next time on the Ask Historians Podcast.